Thank you so much. I can't tell you how jazzed I am to be here. This has been an amazing conference. Um, and just give you a little bit of background. Uh, and thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm, a, um, I'm an engineer aviator turned neurosurgeon. And in my career, I've spent a lot of time dealing with some of the most serious health crises because I was a trauma doctor. I took care of people after head or spinal cord injuries. And you can imagine how challenging that is. Uh, but over the last 25 years, I've devoted my life to, to creating living medicines in the form of cellular therapeutics. That means we take and harness the unique biological potential of stem cells and the derivatives of those cells and turn them into products that can combat disease. So, as we all know, uh, and let me ground the discussion in a few sort of commonalities. Uh, obviously, we're living longer today than ever before, and health is a part of the calculation of wealth as far as I'm concerned. The, uh, the longer we live, uh, which is wonderful, we do, we do recognize that there is an increase in the, in the incidence of chronic diseases, Things that really plague us, like loss of high performance mobility and so on and so forth, characterized as frailty, as well as the thing which we're all terrified of, which is cognitive decline, really makes it, makes it hard to maintain high quality of life as we age. So many of you probably know what stem cells are. I want to just share a couple of basic facts to see if, um, if it resonates with you. The best estimation of how many cells exist in a human being is about 37.2 trillion cells in all of us. All right? Think about that for a second. Consider that your health is only as good as the health of your cells. And consider that those 37 plus trillion cells in your body are derived from a single cell which is created at the moment of fertilization between egg and sperm. And that single cell, which is called a totipotent stem cell, goes on to divide and replicate and specialize into all the different cell types of the body. There are 200 different cell types in the human body. So I want you to think about this. If you originated from a single cell, and your 37 trillion cells today, and those 37 trillion cells are cycling in and out. To give you an example, the red blood cells in your body, okay, you make about two to three million new red blood cells every second of your life. Okay? So think about the scalability, if you will, of biology. As far as I'm concerned, there is nothing we know of in, biology, in science that has the same scalability as living cells. Now, many, many years ago, when I was a trauma surgeon taking care of head and spinal cord injury at Cornell Medical Center in New York, um, I had an epiphany. And the epiphany I, I owe to my oldest daughter, who currently works for me, um, who, when she was in utero and I was a surgeon running the ICU at uh, Cornell Medical Center, I ran down to look at her ultrasound in the first trimester. And I noticed something for the first time. Although she was a peanut-sized embryo at that point, the placenta was this big organ that already developed inside the uterus of, uh, of my wife. And I was fascinated by the fact that in medical school, I was taught that the placenta was a vascular interface between the maternal and the fetal system. But as an engineer, that troubled me, because if that was the case, they would grow at the same rate. The fact that the placenta grew before she did suggested to me that it was the governor of embryogenesis and fetogenesis. And if that's the case, why? It was around the same time that stem cells were first hitting the airwaves as a biological discovery, and people were beginning to think that stem cells might ha have the key to harnessing regenerative potential that could restore functions and quality and so on and so forth. But the problem was, if many of you remember, if you go back 25 years, where were most stem cells being derived from? They were being derived from discarded embryos or from the byproducts of an abortion. Now, as a guy who had been developing therapeutics, medical devices, and technologies for healthcare for about 10 years by that time, it dawned on me that if the only place we were going to get stem cells were going to be discarded embryos or the byproducts of an abortion, the underlying baggage, the moral and ethical baggage, would potentially impede progress there. And I also knew that if you couldn't create a scalable, industry model for cellular medicine, it wasn't going to go anywhere. It would go the way of organ transplantation. Organ transplantation, we all know, works, right? It works. 
You know how many organ transplants are done a year in the world? A tiny, tiny fraction of the opportunities that could be used. So someone had to productize, had to pharmaceuticalize living cells, and it dawned on me that if the placenta actually acted as a stem cell factory and participated in embryogenesis and fetogenesis, that's where we should be looking because there's 150 to 180 million placentas incinerated every year in the world. So if you think about a natural resource, that might be the best natural resource for this field. It also, around that same time, I got to see something as a neurosurgeon which really, really, really astounded me. This is a, this is a photograph of fetal surgery. Now in this particular case, at about, about the first trimester, actually the, around the early second trimester, it was discovered on ultrasound that this developing fetus had a defect in the, in the nervous system called spina bifida. You probably all know that spina bifida occurs when literally the skin doesn't close over the neural tube that's developing and the spinal cord is exposed. The net consequence of that is these babies are born with a damaged spinal cord and they often have lifelong neurologic problems, paralysis, infections, and so on. But if you detect it early by ultrasound, you open the womb, as you see that little incision right there, and you simply sew the skin back over this defect, put the fetus back in the womb and come back six months later, guess what? No, no spina bifida and more importantly, there's no evidence of a scar. No evidence of a scar. So, you know, being the, um, the surgeon, I said, well, geez, if I, could, if I could somehow harness that and put that into use in the treatment of other diseases, that might create a regenerative engine that could restore function in everything. So that fascinated me. Now, I want to take you to another thing I want you to consider because a lot of the discussions are about the information technology world, uh, uh, quantum computing, AI, and so on and so forth. Do, do any of you guys know who Craig Venter is? So Craig, Craig Venter is the first scientist to sequence the human genome. And by the way, Craig and I uh, uh, were partners. We developed a number of companies together. But what I loved about Craig is that he basically distilled down what a stem cell, what, a, what, what the DNA in your body is. It's biological software. And biological software residing in the nucleus of every cell in your body, just like the software that resides in your computers and so on and so forth, is potentially corruptible during your lifetime. Keep that in mind. But I said, well, you know what? If the software is in the nucleus of the cell, where does the processing of that software take place? It takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell, and that means that the surface of the cell is actually like the keyboard. And the keyboard, when it makes contact with the surface of any organ or tissue, actually helps inform the cell where it is. That's why stem cells, when delivered to any part of your body, actually do what they're supposed to do. So if I take a, a stem cell that has versatile potential, can become any mature specialized cell type of the body, and I put it into your liver, it doesn't become a brain cell, it becomes a liver cell because of that instruction. Now, I mentioned before, we're living longer than ever before. Is it worth living longer if you don't have the quality and performance that you had when you were young? And so the, the, the question of whether or not we can, we can really justify the investment in adding 10, 20 years of your, to your life if you are not functioning like you are at your prime. Does that make sense? So, as, a, as, a, as a, an entrepreneur who has built a company that uses living cells to treat diseases like cancer and immunologic disease, and also, as I'm approaching my uh, retirement age of 65, uh, it dawned on me that maybe the, the, the key to maintaining function and performance might reside, might reside in changes that occur to the population of stem cells in our body. I mentioned before, 37 trillion plus cells in your body. There is a large number of those cells that maintain their stem-like characteristics, and they're the ones responsible for renovating and renewing you during your lifetime. So is the reason we age and we begin to degenerate simply because we use up stem cells? And so that was one sort of con uh, uh, concept that we began to muddle around. The other was, if you look at the biology of the disease we fear the most as we age, aside from cognitive decline, cancer, we all know the incidence of cancer increases with your advanced age. And so the consequence of, of, of looking at this and saying, well, maybe aging and cancer, because they have similar biology, should be addressed the same way. And so if aging causes cancer, 
What if we just slow the aging process down? So you take away the narcissistic desire to live forever, so to speak, and you say, well, you know, actually what we really want to do is we want to delay the onset of diseases like cancer. So if you think about it, um, I mentioned to you before, your biological software in your cells, um, like any software system, uh, has to maintain its integrity in order for that cell to function properly. And if you look at everything science has taught us in this field, we recognize that the cellular and molecular hallmarks of aging listed here, and I don't want to go into them into detail, all relate to the stability and the quality of the genetic software in each one of your cells. And if that software goes bad, how do you fix it or how do you replace it? So one of the clear, clear observations we had that is relevant is that if you look at older people, especially older people who don't age well, aside from all of the things you saw on the previous slide, DNA instability, loss of telomere length, that's the little cap on the end of your chromosomes that keeps your DNA uh, in high quality. If you look at all those things, the one common denominator that occurs in aging is that you begin to use up the stem cells in the different reservoirs in your system that are responsible for renewing and restoring and renovating you as you, as you live. And if you think about it, has anybody ever renovated a house? It's always better to renovate a house with high quality new products rather than old exhausted products. So if you look at this graph, it shows that as we age, there is a profound exponential decline in the number of stem cells in our tissues and organs. And in fact, it's, a, it's, it's literally shocking. If you look at the bone marrow of an eight month old, one in about every 20 to 30,000 cells is a stem cell. If you look at the bone marrow of an 80 year old, it's one in 30 million, okay? That's a profound decline in cells we know to be so important at repairing and renovating us. And if you think about it also, look at the graph on the right side, these stem cells not only decline in number, but the, the product of those cells dividing start to become defective. And those defective cells either die early, and that's why, that's why your skin gets wrinkled, that's why you lose your hair, et cetera, but they also become abnormal and lead to things like cancer. So a guy named McGonagall, when I, um, uh, the, the first company that I created in the cellular medicine space, use the process of collecting materials at birth in order to store away stem cells that could be used for these therapeutic ap applications. My company was, was merged into a, a developing uh, biotech company called Cellgene, and during the 15 years there, where we went from a $700 million company to a $120 billion company, I got access to some really cool data. This is some of the data that I saw. And this confirmed what I just showed you on the previous slide. As we age, the number of stem cells declines exponentially, not only in healthy people, but even in people who are, have underlying diseases. So one of the interesting concepts would be, does this happen in every organ and tissue? This work showed that it happens in every organ and tissue. There's a decline in stem cell number and quality, and guess what else? If you look at the top graphs in muscular endurance and, and, and strength, if you look just at muscle tissue, the number of stem cells in muscle declines exponentially with age, and it's associated mathematically with a decline in functionality. That is critical. So the smoking gun of aging has to do with can you maintain a population of high quality cells in your body that retain the high quality software in your genetic material? And if you can, can you avoid the consequences of that DNA being damaged? That's a process called mutation. And this little graph shows a very interesting correlation. Those species that have the best systems for repairing DNA live the longest. The best cells to repair DNA are cells from newborns. Should be obvious to everybody. So we did a little experiment. We took, some, we took some animals, some rats, we collected their stem cells at birth, processed them the way we process cells for therapeutics, cryopreserved them, put them in the deep freeze, minus 180 degrees, which allows these cells to live forever, basically, and then gave them back to these animals as they aged. And what we found was that animals who got back doses of their own cells as they aged lived 40% longer than their, than their siblings, than their littermates. So the physio and anatomic changes that occur with age reflect this continuous renovation and renewal of our body, all driven by stem cells. So stem cells are central to your ability to stay healthy as you age. 
And now, now that we know this, we're beginning to direct this towards targeting diseases that are associated with age, such as frailty. Frailty, both physical frailty and mental frailty, is associated with all of those qualitative changes that we want to avoid as we age. And it gave us a nice place to actually test this out in patients in order to create a tool that, number one, is worthy of being approved by the FDA. And so this condition, and, and to give you kind of an action item, this condition, sarcopenia, which means muscle loss, is an insidious process that starts as early as 25 years of age. And every year of your life, you lose about 1% to 2% of your muscle mass, so that over the course of 20, 30 years, you're half the person you used to be. So what if we could address this? And it's, it's important not just because you want to maintain strength and your physique and all that, but it's because muscle is the principal organ that helps to drive the synthetic processes that keep all of your cells, including cells in your brain, healthy. So right now, we're working on preserving human performance. You guys hear the term longevity all the time. I like to say longevity doesn't matter. I want to preserve performance as long as possible. Maybe it's 90 years, maybe it's 100, maybe it's 150. But if you can maintain high performance mobility, maintain high performance cognitive function, maintain high performance immunity, which is your greatest defense against any disease, and, and <laughs> selfishly maintain youthful aesthetics, that makes every year we give to you worth it. Last but not least, as a company, Cellularity, which uh, is a newly minted public company spun out of Celgene about uh, four years ago, our mission is to take the placenta, the leftovers of, the, of a full-term healthy pregnancy, isolate the cells from that organ, and then use those cells to produce products that can be, can be employed as therapeutics. Among the unique place, uh, uh, cells you can get from this organ include immune cells, like natural killer cells. And natural killer cells are the way your body cleans stuff up. When you, when you age, cells that, are, that become senescent, which are kind of worn out, begin to express markers on those cells that allows them to be targeted by this population of, of white blood cells called natural killer cells, and they clean them out. Interestingly, those same natural killer cells defend you against viral infection, like COVID. They defend you against cancer. And they defend you against aging. So we're developing senolytic cells for that purpose. And then last but not least, we're also actively, actively employing what we call pluripotent stem cells. These are stem cells that have infinite versatility to mature and specialize into all the, cell, the uh, different cell types of the body. We're using them to recharge the regenerative engine. And I want to leave you with this last interesting observation. The placenta is, na is nature's professional universal donor tissue. See, think about it. A mom carries a, a fetus and its placenta for nine months. She's only 50% perfect match to that fetus because she only contributes half the DNA, right? What about surrogate pregnancy? A mom carries a fetus for nine months she has no relationship to. She's completely mismatched. She doesn't reject it, the fetus doesn't reject her. That degree of immunologic tolerance is the basis for the placenta being the source of cells for therapeutics for everybody. Right now at Cellularity, we're the largest repository of newborn cells. We have stored over 100,000 newborn donors from, from uh, placentas that are discarded after birth. And we turn those into therapeutics that are one size fits all and incredibly scalable. Uh, Dan mentioned that, that uh, our book, Life Force, which uh, came out earlier in the year, is, a, is an encyclopedia of these breakthroughs. Uh, and I hope many of you get a chance to, uh, to take advantage of this and use it as a little bit of a source of information for your, for your health objectives. Thank you very much.